My name is William Cooper. Between the years 1970 and 1973, I served on the intelligence briefing team of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, who at that time was Admiral Bernard Clare. I was attached to the Office of Naval Intelligence. I had a top secret, Q, sensitive compartmentalized information, security clearance, and actually had access and the need to know almost everything that the Admiral himself, the members of his staff, and many high-level government officials. It was during this time that during the routine course of my duties, top secret documents crossed my desk that I was able to read that outlined everything that really and truthfully happened according to those documents in Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. According to these top secret documents, the intelligence community and the national security apparatus considered John F. Kennedy to be a threat to the national security. It did not explain what this meant. As stated in those documents, that the assassination pistol used was prepared, manufactured specifically by the Central Intelligence Agency for assassinations. It was electrically operated, gas powered, and could either fire a poison dart, a small hypodermic needle, or an exploding pellet which could contain any one of several deadly poisons. These documents stated that William Greer, the driver of the President's car, a Secret Service agent, an ex-chauffeur of the Lodge family, turned in his seat and fired with this assassination pistol at point-blank range at the President's head, an exploding pellet filled with shellfish toxin, which really killed our President. The documents that I read said that President Kennedy's body was taken out of the casket on the plane and actually arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital a full 30 minutes before the empty casket that the public television cameras and Mrs. Kennedy accompanied. It stated that when the autopsy was performed, they found that the brain had already been severed at the spinal cord and showed little or no damage whatsoever. This has since been conserved, uh, confirmed by independent investigators other than me. But I can prove that as far back as 1972, I told all of these details to several other people, one of whom I have disclosed publicly already. In this film you're going to see, this film narrated by a man named Lars Hansen, uh, the film that he claims that he prepared and discovered. We really haven't gotten to the bottom of that yet. You're going to see this act, but this is a poor film. Watch closely. Keep your eyes on the driver. Remember, if you want to see who murdered a man, don't watch the man being murdered. Now remember that in this tape, which was originally made by Lars Hansen, and it was never meant for public dissemination. Hansen had given a copy of this to Lear, thinking that Lear might be able to help finance his research. Cooper appropriated that. Suddenly, Cooper was claiming that he read in his top secret Navy files back in 1972-1973 that the limousine driver had actually been the person to fire the fatal headshot into JFK. Now, originally on this tape, and originally Cooper claimed that what the Secret Service agent was shooting was a 45 caliber handgun. Now, I'm quite familiar with firearms, with weapons, not only from my military service, but from my law enforcement service. And I'm here to tell you that if you have never fired a 45 automatic or seen one fired, it has extensive muzzle blast. Believe me, you can't miss it. 
but it's obvious on this videotape that there is no muzzle blast which in hindsight makes sense because there's no gun but when that became obvious to Cooper suddenly Cooper started claiming that this was a secret CIA air gun firing a pellet loaded with shellfish toxin now when Hansen discovered that Cooper was starting to hawk this at every venue he could for 25 and 30 bucks a pop to buy a copy of this tape, he tried to get Cooper to stop. Cooper absolutely refused. I mean, when you talk about blatant, one thing you can't take away from William Cooper, he was the most blatant BS artist I have ever run into. But there was a radio host out here in Los Angeles at the time by the name of Tom Likas. And right before a major uh, presentation that Cooper gave at Hollywood High School, Lars Hansen went on the Tom Likas show with Bill Cooper and debated him. And just to give you an idea of how Cooper handled these type of things. Well, I'll have Lars Hansen and Cooper show you. Sir, I wasn't I wasn't pushing this to the public. This was to to get uh, support and assistance from other researchers and from investors. This thing to... is discredited on its face. You talk about Well, fine. That's why I'm not promoting it. That's why I'm not promoting it. That's why I haven't been well, promoting it. Well, then all the I mean, you know what kind of argument fraud because you're putting out a piece of garbage and now you're backtracking. Sir, you put out a piece of black and white nonsense. Hey, look, we've already heard that, pal. I didn't put it out. I gave poor quality copies. That's all I had to work with at the time. The reason I made it was to get some backup and support. That's why I got in touch with Greitz, hoping that some of his associates, like uh, Ross Perot, might be able to fund my getting uh, hold of an excellent quality copy and having it digitally analyzed. That was the reason the thing was produced. If you did any research, you might have known that. That's why I haven't been promoting it or pushing it to the public. Okay? Well, here's Cooper's the, here's the guy that's doing it. Here's another discrepancy there, because you got that copy you had directly from Groden, who, no, according no, to you, that's has the to. best copy in the world. I did you not told me that. that yourself. No, I did not. Oh, yes, you I did. got the, that copy in 8 Oh, yes. I, I have the man who gave it to me, a super 8 millimeter copy from David Evans, okay, in Northern California. You told me you got your copy directly from Bob Groden. No, and I Bob did Groden not. is the man you, you cite I, as your hero and the best researcher and expert on the field. He knows the man who lied to the Senate committee about uh, William Greer take, not taking his hands off the wheel, which people are going to be able to well, see not on only. August the 19th at Hollywood High School, I guarantee you. And they'll make up their own mind. And when they see that, your credibility is going to be down in the bottom of the pit. Bill, my whole point was to get to the truth about the issue of who... We're going to get to it, but the people are going to decide the truth, not you, Lars Hansen. Okay, They're going to see for themselves. I'm not trying to stop it, Bill. Long before... Oh, you yes, you are. You're doing everything you can to stop it, but you won't. The well, American people... Bill, are going to see that film and they're going to know who killed their president. Long before you ever latched onto this subject, Bill, I made the tape and began the research a year before you went public and said you saw it in the documents. I had already researched it and contacted people like Colonel Bogreitz and John Lennon. And we're and telling people, people that William Greer shot President Kennedy and now you're backpedaling and saying somebody proved that he didn't. Show us the proof. No, Where's won't... the proof that Greer didn't shoot the president? Well, it's it's on You've said way. right here that it's been proven. Show us the proof. Where's the proof? How am I going to show you? You're trying to radio. keep the American people from knowing oh, who on, shot the Bill. president. That's, you said it yourself. That's BS. Tom, did he say it or not? He said it was proven that Greer am, didn't shoot the president. What I am trying to do is get people to understand that that tape does we not, know what either you're way, to do. does not constitute absolute proof. Okay? All right, we'll continue this conversation. Notice the bully boy tactics, the screaming over Hanson. I knew back in those days that this was a discredited piece of video footage. Here's the bottom line story on what people were actually seeing, and it wasn't a gun. You got to remember the time that this video or this this uh, film was shot. Dallas, Texas, November 1963. And what did men use on their hair? 
well, that greasy kid stuff like Brill Cream. And the bottom line was when they washed the Keller out of the film, there was a reflection off of the Secret Service driver's head, or the Secret Service passenger's head. And it's literally just a split second that it does, in fact, look like there's an object pointing at Kennedy. And as it turns out, this was the exact moment that Kennedy was, in fact, shot in the head. Probably, my own opinion now, probably from the grassy knoll. Okay, I'm hearing more and more people who actually believe that Bill Greer, the driver of the limousine, turned around and shot President Kennedy. That is absolutely false, and I'm going to show you why even the most radical pro-conspiracy people reject that idea. As we go through these frames, I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention to Roy Kellerman, who sat next to Greer. Notice the glare on the top of Kellerman's head, which will diminish as he starts to duck and the angle changes. The reason that happens is that Kellerman's head falls into the shadow of the sun visor on his side of the car. By frame 300, the glare is almost gone, but it will return as he straightens back up. Okay, this is frame 312, one eighteenth of a second before the terrible head explosion. It's probably the clearest and sharpest frame in the sequence and it gives us an excellent look at Bill Greer. Okay, that is his left shoulder. And that is his left hand. And that is his right hand. And that is the top of Roy Kellerman's head. It is not a gun. Okay, keep in mind, this is frame 312 exactly one eighteenth of a second before the fatal headshot. The reason we've been focusing on that frame is the 313 is horribly blurred and it makes it difficult to see a lot of detail. But even with all the blurring, we can still see that Greer's hands are on the lower part of the steering wheel. If any of you still have doubts about this, I would suggest you consider several questions. There were hundreds of people in Dealey Plaza that day. How is it that not even one person claimed that Greer fired a weapon? But let's say that Greer got lucky, and nobody happened to notice that he blew up the president's head. Shouldn't he have been trying to escape? I mean, why did he instead drive his victim to the hospital and then hang around where he would surely expect to be arrested? At that point in time, he had no way of knowing that his dastardly deed went unnoticed. And finally, think about the Secret Service agents who were standing on the running board of the follow-up car, which was almost bumper to bumper with the limousine. There's just no way they could have overlooked something like that. You really think Clint Hill, who risked his life to get to the president and Mrs. Kennedy, was in on the cover-up? There are plenty of good logical reasons to support the fact that this crime was a conspiracy. But the theory that the driver turned around and shot JFK is not one of them. Thanks for listening, folks. My name is Bob Harris.